Good afternoon and welcome to the third uh, seminar in this year's Health Law Institute seminar series. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Leo Boletsky. My name is Matthew Herter, I should say. I'm the director of the Health Law Institute here at Dalhousie. Professor Boletsky holds a joint appointment with the Northeastern School of Law in Boston and the Bube College of Health Sciences at the same university. His expertise is on the use of law to improve health with a focus on drug policy, reducing the spread of infectious diseases like HIV, and the role of criminal justice systems and the enforcement of criminal law in shaping public health outcomes. I'm going to keep it brief, brief in terms of an introduction, because I think the great turnout today is, is excited to hear what Professor Boletsky has to say. Professor Boletsky has been working on the opioid epidemic before it was described as such, before it was on newspaper front pages every single day. I think he's been working or researching, writing about this problem since the early 2000s. Sadly, many of you are here today because the profile and scope of that problem has deepened um, quite tragically. So I look forward to hearing Professor Boletsky's presentation from Panacea to Panopticon, thinking specifically about prescription drug monitoring programs that a variety of jurisdictions have set up here in Nova Scotia, but as well, of course, in various states in the United States. So without further ado, I'll welcome Professor Leo Boletsky. Thank you so much. Uh, so first, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Erdman and Professor Herder for inviting me here. It's really uh, a huge pleasure to be here, and um, it's my first time in Halifax, and it's lovely, and I hope to come back and explore it further. Um, and today, I wanted to talk about uh, the implementation of prescription monitoring programs or prescription drug monitoring programs as they're known in the states um, in the context of the opioid crisis. So to situate the discussion, I'm going to start with just a very brief note about public health surveillance in general um, and sort of some of the benefits and drawbacks and uh, potential side effects of having uh, surveillance systems in place. So uh, prescription monitoring programs represent uh, an example of a public health surveillance system. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, huge explosion in the number and scope of prescription monitoring in the context of the opioid crisis. Um, then I hope to share with you some empirical insights into this issue, so talking about not just conceptual legal issues, but um, actually using empirical uh, methods to try to explore some of the problems that, that I'll highlight. Um, and then I'll just mention a few emerging trends that are troubling um, to kind of, uh, you know, pique your interest, especially if you're a student or a researcher, to think about how some of the uh, deployment is uh, maybe problematic, at least in the United States. Um, and then I'll conclude with uh, a few discussion points about sort of the policy and the legal implications. So, to start us off, I actually wanted to, oops, um, to mention that uh, the concerns, some of the concerns that I'll, that I'll describe are not purely theoretical as we often do in law. You know, we kind of fall into the trap of, you know, sort of creating fact patterns that are, that are purely theoretical. So some of, the, some of the discussion today will be about privacy and I just wanted to bring up the situation that actually emerged in the last couple of weeks, um, or an incident rather, and that is in the context of actually another public health crisis in the U.S., which is gun violence, but in the context of the horrible events that occurred in, um, in Las Vegas, the mass shooting there, um, <coughs> next day there was uh, leaked information about the uh, about the shooter from the prescription drug monitoring program. And this incident, I think, highlights the, the danger. I mean, so, you know, personal health information is always somewhat vulnerable to being disclosed in an authorized way, but prescription drug monitoring programs, as I'll talk about, 
uh, create a, you know, basically a clearinghouse, a centralized clearinghouse of prescription information to which a lot of people have access. And so um, that brings up the danger that this information can be inappropriately accessed and leaked, and, and this incident actually um, highlights the, the risks of that. And, um, you know, also, obviously, aside from the harm to the individual, also creates a lot of um, problems for people who might, you know, so the implications the pl implication here is, uh, you know, the shooter was prescribed certain uh, drugs that are, um, you know, anti-depression uh, medication. And so what implication uh, is made after that kind of information is disclosed is that, you know, all people with depression are prone to violence, as is often talked about. You know, in the U.S., when there's a mass shooting, oftentimes people start talking about, oh, well, there's, you know, mental health issues and we need to uh, deal better with people who have mental health issues. Uh, leaving aside the point that people who have mental health issues um, are much more frequently victims of violence and not perpetrators of violence. And so I think, you know, this kind of disclosure actually creates broader societal problems and risks than just the individual who is affected. So to situate the discussion, I think it's important to, um, to talk a little bit about the complex history of public health surveillance. So um, in the US, as well as many other places, uh, you know, public health surveillance is an essential tool. In order to respond in an informed fashion to public health or health problems, we have to know, we have to have information about um, you know, the scope of the problem, who is affected, who is most vulnerable, um, where, you know, where problems are cropping up and occurring in order to target resources. So public health surveillance is a really important fundamental tool, essentially, uh, to, to an appropriate and measured public health response. However, these kinds of, inter uh, these kinds of surveillance systems have not always been deployed in the most measured or even way, and have oftentimes mapped out uh, onto other kinds of uh, surveillance and uh, uh, basically, you know, state repression um, efforts. Um, so, you know, for example, there used to be uh, public health surveillance uh, or reportable sort of mandates to report certain kinds of uh, patient uh, provider interactions. So. So providers were in some states uh, required to report uh, abortions or, or um, attempted abortions. There were public health surveillance focused on venereal disease, um, on HIV. Um, and, and again, you know, these are not necessarily sinister kinds of interventions uh, in surveillance systems, but the way that they were deployed uh, oftentimes unevenly, oftentimes targeting people of color, oftentimes targeting people who are economically disadvantaged, whereas people who are not, uh, who are more wealthy, for example, a lot of times uh, um, STI surveillance, for example, was only instituted in public hospitals. So only poor people were targeted with surveillance where people who could pay for private care were not. Um, same thing is true now, for example, of uh, drug testing. So a lot of times, you know, and this is in the States, you know, I, I, I do not attempt to speak of the Canadian context. Um, so drug testing of pregnant women, for example, uh, in many states is mandated for uh, people who are on Medicare, which is the social, uh, socialized medicine program for, for people who are just economically disadvantaged in the United States. Drug testing for people who receive, for pregnant women who receive private care is not mandated and in fact is very rarely done. So uh, to say that we need these diagnostic tools in order to inform proper care, but yet imposing these uh, surveillance systems only on people who are disadvantaged obviously brings up a lot of equity concerns. Um, so the you know, the overall framework that I'll come back to in this, in this discussion today is the idea of how 
introducing a surveillance framework into the provider patient relationship might change that relationship. And so, um, you know, creating a surveillance system is not, it doesn't just collect information, it also creates a uh, perceived and real um, sort of um, in intervention into the interaction between a doctor and patient. So when a doctor is uh, being surveilled through this kind of system and a patient is being surveilled, that can change their behavior. And so in that, in that sense, a surveillance system is both an intervention and a way to collect data. So it's not a sort of a neutral, uh, a neutral intervention. And it also, it also brings up the uh, discussion and discourse around dual loyalty, um, which is the concept of you know, who is really, uh, who's the boss essentially with, uh, you know, in the doctor-patient relationship. Is it the patient? So theoretically, you know, the duty of the provider is always to the patient, but in fact, there's this concept of dual loyalty, so in a lot of uh, sort of socialized medicine context, that, um, uh, that dual loyalty also belongs not just to the patient, but to the state, so when the doctor is working for the state. And in the context of non-socialized medicine context, uh, you know, the insurance company or whoever is paying the bills essentially, so who does the, who does the provider owe their loyalty to. And so prescription drug monitoring programs really kind of harp on that, um, on that issue because they reorient how providers are practicing um, and what their metrics of success may be. So within that larger discussion of public health surveillance, um, I think it's important to talk about, uh, you know, to situate that that discourse or to situate prescription monitoring in that discourse. So prescription monitoring, uh, essentially, it's, it's actually, it dates back to the early 1900s. The idea uh, behind prescription monitoring is you want to balance medication access with diversion control. So drugs that are dangerous, that can cause addiction, that can cause, you know, people to experience a lot of, um, negative consequences. Uh, there was an effort in the early 1900s to bring some semblance of regulation to opioids, to cocaine, to other kinds of medications that were being prescribed in a very sort of loose, you know, what was perceived as a loose way. In the modern era, so the modern prescription monitoring program really emerges uh, in the 1970s and coincides with two developments. One is the development of electronic tools. So traditionally, prescription monitoring had been done on paper. So it was done through, you know, a prescriber would prescribe the drug and use uh, carbon copy forms, one of which would go to the patient, one of which would go to the provider, and in some states, actually they were required to, act, to file a form with a regulatory agency. So it was a paper-based system, uh, you know, very clunky, obviously not uh, terribly nimble for any kind of uh, data analysis or response. The 1970s and, and later bring a new era to this effort uh, because you saw a, you know, the deployment of um, electronic tools, computer tools. So instead of um, filing the information on paper, there started to be systems that would actually allow people to do electronic filing, or if they did paper filing, those paper forms would be then uh, transferred onto computer disks, basically, or tapes in that, in that era. And just to very quickly mention, there was actually one of the landmark privacy cases in the U.S. Uh, jurisprudence was a Supreme Court uh, case called uh, Whalen versus Roe in 1977, where both doctors and patients actually challenged the New York State's prescription monitoring program um, and said this is an intrusion uh, uh, both into medical practice as well as patient privacy. 
and uh, the Supreme Court, which had actually been marching towards m providing more privacy protections, uh, this is a Warren court, um, actually walked back and said, you know what, this is a, a rational use of government power and we're going to essentially allow this New York State program to proceed. And that really laid the groundwork to the development of prescription monitoring uh, in the modern era because essentially it gave carte blanche to states uh, to develop these kinds of surveillance efforts without uh, a lot of privacy protections. And also, just, I'll just mention uh, very quickly, uh, those efforts in the 1970s also coincided with basically what was the, the early days of the war on drugs and this, you know, a lot of drug hysteria basically about uh, heroin and about cocaine and, you know, kind of uh, looking at healthcare providers as pushers of drugs and trying to bring some semblance of regulation to what was perceived to be a system that was out of control. And in many ways, the prescription drug monitoring program um, anchored in what was the landmark uh, legislation of the time to respond to the, uh, to kind of launch the war on drugs, the Controlled Substances Act, which created a schedule of drugs and is actually a similar framework in Canada. So uh, it, the, the statute defined sort of substances of abuse or drugs of abuse in this kind of graded schedule. So there's schedule one through five um, based on criteria that are kind of nebulous, but uh, essentially, you know, drugs uh, potential for abuse and uh, accepted medical use. And so based on those criteria, drugs are defined in the scheduling framework. And the reason why that's uh, significant for the prescription monitoring discussion is that a lot of prescription monitoring systems actually use that schedule to say, you know what? Um, we're going to track those control substances that are defined by the statute in our monitoring efforts. And so uh, because that framework, that, that, that scheduling definition was very, very broad, um, the prescription monitoring efforts were then equally broad because they used it as, a, as an anchor, as a reference. So. Up until 1970s, uh, you know, these, these systems were relatively seldom used. They were in place in a bunch of places. Uh, I'll, I'll show a slide in a minute. But in the context of the opioid crisis, uh, they became a, a very central tool. And the reason why they became a central tool and a tool that a lot of states were relying on is because the early, um, the early phase of the opioid crisis was seen as one driven by prescription medications. Um, same in Canada, but you know, to a much, unfortunately, to a shockingly you know, broader extent. I mean, these numbers, in the context of you know, the awful situation in Canada in some provinces, this you know, really pales in comparison to the U.S. situation, and this is why as Professor Erdman said in an early meeting, you know, we really shouldn't be looking to the U.S. for solutions to the opioid crisis because we've done a really horrible job at managing this crisis. So uh, the early days of the prescription opioid, uh, the, the, the opioid crisis were characterized by a pretty steady, substantial rise in overdoses related to prescription medications. Um, so that was the first phase. And then we saw basically a leveling off, so this, this line is prescription drugs, a leveling off in the um, uh, prescription-related overdoses and a, uh, essentially a, a almost simultaneous stratospheric rise in heroin-related overdoses. And then the third, uh, the third phase of the crisis really started um, around 2014, 2013, 2014, when you st started to see what had been a pretty low number of fentanyl related to overdoses, where that number is just absolutely skyrocketed. Um, and this is why, you know, I think, I have some, some reservations about using the word epidemic to describe this because it's not technically an epidemic. This is not a contagion, but the dynamic of this crisis as it has evolved in the United States is absolutely mind-boggling and, and it's just developed so quickly um, and, 
you know, we really haven't seen this level of deaths since the AIDS epidemic. Um, and it actually has surpassed uh, those numbers uh, as of 2015. So I talk about this to situate the discussion, but also to point out that, you know, in fact, prescription drug deaths were the driver of the crisis for a period of time, you know, up until about 20, 20, uh, 2010, 2011, and now it's really uh, heroin and fentanyl. So we've entered a new phase. And it's not like prescription-related deaths have absolutely plummeted. Um, but they also, but they have uh, plateaued to a certain extent, and in many ways, a lot of these data are also um, difficult to disentangle because sometimes um, what people think are prescription drugs that they buy on the streets are, you know, fentanyl, and uh, so you know, it's oftentimes hard to distinguish whether you take uh, oxycontin that's. Uh, you know, on the street that looks like Oxycontin or it's uh, an illegally manufactured drug. So in some ways, these data also, uh, you know, aggregate a lot of illicit medications that were not pharmaceutically manufactured um, into that prescription drug category. In other words, this number of prescription-related deaths is probably actually lower, and, 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 uh, and that's going to be hard to, um, hard to track. So the narrative, you know, in a context of this dynamic crisis, the narrative about its causes and its solutions really focused on uh, supply side problems. And what I mean by that is that people, uh, policymakers, as well as a lot of public health folks and folks who work in healthcare, have basically singularly attributed the crisis to an oversupply of prescription medications. So the narrative goes that, you know, we were very, uh, extremely overly liberal in providing prescription medications and we got people hooked and these doctors were pushing medications on people or were, you know, giving, um, you know, the, the standard story in the media, for example, is that you had a high, high school athlete who had a sprained ankle and they got, you know, a, a bunch of Oxycontins and then they kind of slid off the rails and started using heroin. Um, and that narrative uh, also implicates a lot of the, so sort of the race and class issues as well. So um, instead of is in the past there was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of judgment about the moral failings of people who use drugs. In, in this context, in the in context of this crisis, um, the tables have kind of flipped and we oftentimes characterize the crisis as iatrogenic in the sense that the healthcare system actually hooked people on drugs and they were kind of blameless victims and that we need to be doing more. Um, so, um, in fact, there was uh, certainly uh, overprescribing in the sense that opioids became kind of a catch-all. So, people presenting with a variety of complex problems uh, in the U.S. and I think to a certain degree in Canada, uh, the easy answer became, well, you can take this and it'll make you feel better no matter what's wrong with you. Opioids make you feel better. Uh, whether you have physical pain, emotional pain, stress, uh, other kinds of, you know, things that may be bothering you, opioids are kind of a, a catch-all salve uh, that, that essentially make those problems go away. And so, um, to the extent that U.S. and, and Canada, to, to a certain extent, have a lot of structural problems, have a lot of problems with the healthcare system and the way that we treat uh, a lot of complex issues. Um, having, those, having those drugs close at hand and easy to prescribe uh, was, was the thing that I, I believe drove, you know, this kind of overprescribing issue. So, you know, people often talk about, well, opioids shouldn't be the first sort of, uh, you know, the first intervention that you reach to. You should, if someone presents with 
complex pain issues, you should first deploy, you know, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical therapy and acupuncture and all these other things. Well, okay, you know, that may or may not be true. Actually, the, the evidence behind those interventions is, is not, not very solid. But even if th that is true, um, how do you pay for that? How do you get access to that? Who has time to navigate the system to reach for those other interdisciplinary interventions? So the archi architecture of the healthcare system really is configured to favor easy and quick fixes, of which opioids certainly are. Um, but that's not actually the, you know, how the problem was framed. The problem was framed as you know, we're just using too many of these drugs, we need to use fewer of them, and then the problem will be, will be solved. Um, along, along those lines, a lot of discussion was focused on um, uh, people who are doctor shopping, so going to a, a bunch of different providers and getting drugs from different sources and selling them or, you know, diverting them or misusing them in, in other ways. And also, uh, uh, you know, just purely sort of rogue and venal uh, providers who are just, you know, essentially flooding communities with opioids. And that certainly occurred uh, to a small extent. Um, and then finally, you know, the role of the pharmaceutical industry uh, and insurance industry and, and, and sort of the relationship, the cozy relationship between pharma and its regulators and how the pharmaceutical industry basically misrepresented a lot of these drugs as being low risk when in fact the risk was uh, quite a bit higher. Now given that narrative, given the narrative of, of you know, supply focused uh, root causes of the crisis, um, and th that narrative really gives rise to the idea that if you could only clamp down on the supply, that would actually help fix the issue. That gave rise to uh, the, the imperative to make sure that we had um, tools in place to help sort of regulate prescribing in a much more tight way. And, and P, uh, prescription drug monitoring programs or prescription monitoring programs become a central element or a central feature of that effort. Now, um, the way that prescription monitoring programs were discussed was basically that they could do a bunch of stuff. They could do all of these different things, and I list them here. So a lot of it was focused on, you know, sort of um, surveilling and regulating access. Um, so m catching bad prescribers, rogue prescribers, catching doctor shoppers, um, and also deterring people from engaging those, in those practices. Also, there was a discussion of kind of the clinical value of prescription monitoring. So, so not just surveillance, but also knowing that a patient is getting one drug from one provider and another drug from another provider can inform clinical decision making, theoretically, right? So if you only know what you yourself are doing as a provider, that limits the scope of your knowledge about the patient and uh, can harm healthcare practice. So if you if your patient is getting benzodiazepines from one provider and you're prescribing high-dose high opioids, um, it's helpful to actually know that and, and be able to moderate um, your prescribing practices in a way that minimizes patient risk. So there's a pr the care coordination function. Um, there's this also the idea that it, uh, prescription monitoring can inform uh, patient communication. Uh, in terms of, oh, well, I see that you have gone to a bunch of different providers. Why is that? What is going on in your life? Um, there also can be a um, sort of a treatment referral function. Um, and so all of these positive sort of clinical practice decision support uh, uh, elements have been something that both regulators and healthcare providers have highlighted um, in, the, in an effort to encourage healthcare providers to use these systems more. They, they say, well, you can, you can use it for all of these different clinical support functions. Um, uh, and then also, there's obviously a, kind of a public health surveillance benefit, which is, you know, for example, if you see 
in the prescription monitoring system that a community is being flooded with, with prescription opioids, that might inform your prevention efforts. Like you might want to do outreach to uh, make sure that people are aware of overdose risk and distributing naloxone or figure out what's going on in that community. Why is, it, you know, why is so many people being prescribed opioids? Um, let's think about the structural issues that might be in play. So uh, prescription monitoring, as I mentioned, really exploded on the scene with the rise of the opioid crisis. So you see you know, around somewhere from 2000 to 2012, just to 2013, a huge explosion in the number of these systems in the US. So these are states and, and District of Columbia. All of the states now have one. Um, now, these systems are very limited in the sense that they don't really collect much contextual information about the patient. They basically just collect patient demographics, what drugs they're prescribing, what dosages, and where those drugs are being dispensed. And I think that's an important issue that I'll come back to. Now, the way that the systems are being used, uh, so, the, you know, I just mentioned all of the kind of theoretical uses, but the practical uses, the way that it's actually being implemented is, uh, is several. So um, one is that a lot of these systems are running, uh, continuously running algorithms to sort of identify outliers, both among patients and providers. So there's a surveillance, kind of a big data surveillance function where um, the systems are, are, are designed to identify um, what are deemed dangerous practices or by, both by providers and by patients. Um, so the data are then used to focus on providers in terms of, so, uh, so like uh, in Massachusetts, for example, the, the system will automatically generate a letter to a provider if they're seen as an outlier and saying, you're in the top, you know, 10% of prescribers, not sure what's going on, but, the, you know, this is problematic. And also they generate alerts. Uh, if there's a patient who is deemed a doctor shopper, they will issue alerts to providers saying, you have a doctor shopper in your practice, um, you know, do something about it. Not, not sure what. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of the patients, um, this information is also used to kind of go after patients to, uh, who are deemed to be engaging in, in problematic practices. In terms of the actual dynamics of how the systems work, again, um, there is a uh, supporting policy environment that actually now mandates providers to check the system every time. And I think that may be in place here in Nova Scotia as well. So in Massachusetts, for every new patient, you're supposed to look up uh, the patient on the, pr on the prescription monitoring program. And uh, to, if you prescribe a Schedule 2 or Schedule 3 substances, which are deemed the most risky, uh, you're supposed to uh, consult the system every time. And then pharmacists also consult the system as well. Importantly, even though there's a training for law enforcement on accessing data in the PMP that's mandated, um, there's no training for providers beyond how to log on to the system. So there's no information or guidance for healthcare providers on using the system as a decision support tool. So all of those things that I mentioned in terms of care coordination, starting conversation with your patients, um, you know, uh, getting people linked up to substance use treatment based on, on system information, there's no guidance, training, or any kind of effort. This is like an assumption that providers will use this information to, to, to inf inform their clinical decision making, but there is no, uh, no concerted effort to develop those kinds of practices. So there's been a, a lot of criticism of PMPs, and I want to kind of situate my discussion in those critiques. So the mainstream critiques of PMPs are basically that they're clunky, they're you know, uh, hard to use, uh, 
that they are not interlinked between states. So oftentimes, you know, a person, uh, and I think that may be true of provinces as well, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, a patient has a medical, basically this limited medical record in one state, but then if they go to another state, you can't see what else is going on. You can only see what happened in, within that jurisdiction of that state. Um, they're also not, uh, healthcare providers are not uh, compensated in any way for spending the time. So if you're going to mandate people to look their patients up on this uh, electronic medical, uh, electronic uh, prescription monitoring program, they're going to spend, you know, maybe one or two minutes doing that. But within a context of the very high pressure U.S., uh, you know, healthcare market, they only have, let's say, 12 minutes. And if they're going to spend 12 minutes, uh, two minutes of that 12 minutes looking the patient up and they can't bill for that, for that activity, it really creates an unfunded mandate that a lot of uh, providers really um, uh, resist. Um, and then finally, that uh, information about the patient's drug uh, treatment data and their prescription data are not integrated. So a patient could go to a methadone clinic and get prescribed methadone. That information is not going to show up in the prescription monitoring program because there's this federal law that basically creates a firewall between the two. And, and a lot of people have argued that that should be lifted. Um, so there's been some additional critiques that are not mainstream, so myself and some others. Uh, that, basically, that basically boils down to, okay, you're collecting this information, but how is it going to be used? Um, and that's, uh, you know, kind of rooted in this whole literature of decision support science. Um, you know, provi healthcare providers can use different aids, including technical aids, to support their decision making. Um, but, you know, that has to be really kind of, uh, you know, this kind of techie talk, but it has to be a user and centered approach. Like, you have to ask the users how they, uh, what information they need, how they're going to use that information. PDMPs were not designed with that idea. They were designed from this kind of surveillance uh, framework, and many times they were designed by law enforcement agencies. Another major critique is that how does having the system in place affect what people do? And that goes back to this idea that creating a surveillance system not only collects data, but also changes practice because people perceive um, you know, others looking in and trying to track what they're doing and then responding in ways that may, they may not like. Um, so, you know, providers, for example, if they have a person who is a doctor shopper in their practice and they get a red flag, how do they respond to that red flag? I think it's also important to mention, you know, again, kind of in the context of uh, the earlier point I made about equity, that these systems can affect people differently. So people who are especially vulnerable um, include, for example, people who are going, going through gender reassignment surgery uh, or gender reassignment process. So, um, and this is because, bizarrely, PMPs actually track testosterone and estrogen because they're uh, deemed as uh, you know, uh, substances that are, that are vulnerable to abuse because of anabolic steroid use. And so uh, PM, PDM, PDMPs, I, I think, in, in Canada as well, in the U.S. for sure, track your prescription of testosterone. You know, uh, in, this is what happens when you have a broad-based, you know, drug scheduling framework that is very, very inclusive of substances that need to be controlled, and then you anchor that, you anchor your monitoring efforts on that kind of broad statutory framework. Um, also, people who are especially vulnerable, I think, are people who have negative experience, who are more vulnerable to negative experiences in the healthcare system. So, uh, people of lower socioeconomic uh, status, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, people who have traditionally had sort of experiences where they've been rebuked or discriminated against in the healthcare system might experience this kind of surveillance in a different way. Uh, they might deem themselves at more risk of being, for example, surveilled by law enforcement when they 
when they go and get their prescription drugs, and those drugs are tracked by this you know, state-level uh, state system. So there's actually been very little um, empirical work to try to understand how these systems function in real life. Um, so the work, a lot of the work has really focused on this kind of more policy level approach. So uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, you classify states as having or not having a prescription monitoring program, and then you look at what the health outcomes are, and you try to see if it makes a difference. You know, do states with um, prescription monitoring programs uh, have, for example, a lower prescription rates or lower prescription overdose rates. And so the evidence on that is actually mixed and is extremely, without getting into the weeds of sort of the epi stuff, it's extremely hard to disentangle um, these kinds of policy interventions from other policy interventions because oftentimes PDMP or PMP legislation was passed as a package of a bunch of stuff. So there were often you know, prescription controls imposed and other kinds of interventions. And so a lot of the literature that's been published actually does a very poor job of disentangling those co-interventions and saying, well, it's the PMP that made a difference and not those other things. So even in the context of defining you know, the success of PMPs, for example, as lowering the number of people who are prescribed medication, um, they actually have been found to affect that. So if you know, a lot of articles, probably about a half dozen articles, have now shown that implementing or having a PMP law um, is, is correlated with having low per, lower prescription rates um, in your state. Uh, but those, th first of all, you know, they haven't properly controlled for confounders. And also the question arises of, okay, well, if you've lowered prescription rates, kind of going back to that graph of the opioid crisis, um, what happens to the overdose rates overall? Because you know, the problem is that you're seeing a lot of people transitioning from the prescription drug market into the black market. And so to the extent that kind of constricting that supply of opioid prescriptions, if in fact PMPs do that, that might be contributing to people actually entering the black market, which is actually you know, public health disaster. It's not a benefit. Um, so I'll just briefly, I'm kind of running out of time, but I'll briefly mention two studies that um, uh, I did with, the, with a couple of colleagues on sort of the empirical implementation to, to use empirical tools to track the implementation of PMPs, how they actually work on the ground. Um, so this first study is an ethnographic study with um, a group of prescribers, pharmacists, <laughs> regulators, and law enforcement, and um, uh, drug users. And I'll just uh, kind of, you know, to give voice to the participants, I'll just kind of put these up, these quotations. So, you know, this sort of hypothetical critique that I, that I mentioned earlier where prescribers could be seeing PMPs as a uh, a tool of surveillance in a way that's uh, probably affecting their medical practice uh, that's negative and sparking or spurring the kind of defensive practices that are actually detrimental to the patient. Um, the providers we talked to uh, talked a lot about you know, how the surveillance system is affecting their thinking and their risk perception of being dinged for certain kinds of practices. Um, so, you know, the, what this boils down to is essentially the fact that having problematic patients in your practice, having patients who are on high doses of opioids, or having patients that might be engaging in doctor shopping or, or, um, or drug-seeking behavior is a liability for a provider. So as a provider, you don't want to have those patients in your practice because those patients will be flagged by the system and then you're going to have hell to pay for the fact that you have this patient in your practice. So what is the response of a provider to that kind of liability? The response, the easy way out is to say to the patient, you know what, don't come back. I don't want you in my practice. So when a, when a provider does that, they've just shed themselves of liability. 
But what they've created is on an individual level and on a public health level, they've just created the disaster because that patient is likely not just going to say, oh, well, I guess I better stop using opioids now. Um, they're probably going to say, uh, well, I could go to a different provider, but they'll probably look me up on the PDMP and find the same information and I'll be rebuked by that provider as well, or worse, they'll call the cops on me. So the response is probably from the patient's perspective is that I'm going to go out and look for black market supplies of opioids, which are readily available and in fact cheaper and easier to get. And we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that we engage patients in care, provide wraparound services rather than cutting them out. And when we talk to healthcare, uh, uh, when we talk to drug users, sorry, uh, they oftentimes talked about uh, the prescription drug monitoring as, well, this person uses the word, uh, you know, it's a tool of oppression. So they saw it as a, a wedge between their provider and patient relationship. They saw it as a way to track, for government to track them and to go after them for certain things. And so, you know, the, the natural response from a person who has substance use issues um, and maybe is misusing opioids is then to uh, go to a marketplace where they're not being surveilled in the same way and that is, uh, that is the black market. And that's, again, not something that is a desirable outcome. So I'll just mention quickly, second study that we did was uh, a social listening analysis, and this is a new method, at least to me, where you scrub the web for um, certain information uh, related to a, to a topic. So in this case, we looked at the um, postings on Reddit related, to Reddit is an online forum related to prescription drug monitoring or prescription monitoring programs and we conduct, conducted a sentiment analysis. So basically kind of, it's like the word on the street except that it's the word on the web. Like what are people saying? Uh, so mentions of uh, PMPs went up drastically in probably in concert with the overall rise in the scope and the number of these programs. And I'll just um, mention this quickly that the um, sentiments were generally positive, well, they were mixed actually uh, between positive and negatives among providers. So the, the dark blue, uh, sorry, the light blue is, is prescribers and dispensers of drugs. Uh, again, commenting on Reddit about prescription monitoring and they were uh, overwhelmingly negative among uh, patients and family members, which was interesting. Um, I mean, this quote to me is interesting because a provide, a, this, this is a provider speaking and they're saying, you know what, these systems are really great because I basically tracked a patient and I figured out that they were engaging in inappropriate practices and they you know, basically walked out. They said, you got me and walked out. So this, this provider is using this as in a positive light, again, because it helps them to say, okay, I'm not then going to prescribe drugs to this patient and I'm not going to engage them in, in my practice. But f you know, from a health care and public health perspective, this is actually not a good outcome because they let someone walk out who probably needed a lot of help. So, um, so I think uh, this actually is, is probably a good concluding point. Um, which is that PMPs are not in themselves a benefit. Uh, PMPs are a potential tool to improve care coordination, to engage patients in uh, better wraparound services, and they're a tool to um, improve the public health response to the opioid crisis. But how um, those tools are used has not been discussed enough. And, and this is, you know, again, I'm focusing on the US. Um, in Canada, actually, we just had a meeting where I heard a lot of heartening comments about how um, you know, the thinking about PMPs is different. And so you know, I just definitely want to say that that is you know, integrating the 
prescription monitoring information with contextual data about what the patient is experiencing and using that holistically um, and using it in a context of the fact that you know prescription is not the only source of drug access. There's also a black market. We function in the context of a wide availability of drugs on a black market. And so the way that we, we uh, deploy supply reduction interventions has to be informed by that reality. There needs to be a lot more thinking about, okay, well, if you find certain information in the prescription monitoring program uh, database, how do you use that information to improve patient outcomes and to improve public health outcomes? That discussion, at least in the U.S., really has not been had. Um, and then I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of communication to make sure that providers, for example, do not think that they're expected to fire problematic patients. So, um, you know, that perception may or may not be based on reality. So medical boards may not actually come after you if you have problematic patients in your practice, but if providers see it that way, that's what makes the difference. And the same thing is true of patients. If patients think that the, the prescription monitoring programs and databases are being to, used to track them for law enforcement to come after them, um, and that affects them uh, in a way where they actually um, are pushed out of the healthcare practice, um, of the healthcare setting, continuum of, of services, uh, that should not, um, we should change that perception and make sure that people do not perceive, that we don't use the system in that way and that people do not perceive that the system is being used in that way. So I had a, a couple of other things I'll just mention super quickly. Um, there's uh, jurisprudence in the US that actually makes the situation worse. Uh, so there are just two cases, one in, in uh, Oregon, one in, in Utah, that basically extinguish privacy protections uh, on the state level. Uh, so the federal government and the states went to court and the federal government won and said, we don't need a warrant to access PMP information for law enforcement purposes. We just need an administrative subpoena, which is basically the Drug Enforcement Administration saying, we want this information because we want it don't ask us why, give it to us now. Um, you know, this quote is like, raises, definitely raises eyebrows, at least for me. <laughs> so one of the judges basically said that people have no expectation of privacy in their prescribing data. Uh, this is a, you know, a federal appeals court, <laughs> kind of strange. So, so yeah, so, so basically we went from having 13 states having a warrant requirement, which is in itself interesting that not all states have that, very few, but we went to no states having a warrant requirement for law enforcement access. Um, another emerging uh, situation is that uh, PMP information is now being bundled with criminal justice data. So when you look a patient up on the system, you see if, if the patient has been convicted of a drug crime, or in the case of Wisconsin, if they've been like accused of a drug crime and not even convicted. And that raises a lot of questions about, you know, if these systems are a healthcare decision support tool, what kind of healthcare decision is that supposed to inform? You know, if the per person has been convicted of a drug crime, especially in the context of what we know about how drug laws are being unevenly, uh, uh, unevenly deployed, uh, towards certain uh, groups of the population. So what does that say about what these systems are designed to do, really? Um, you know, I'll probably just conclude on this conceptual note that I think, uh, you know, designing surveillance systems to really uh, protect confidentiality and privacy and, and preserve the, the doctor-patient or the provider-patient relationship it is actually good for public health. It's not, they're not opposing um, imperative, imperatives, but they're actually uh, um, synergistic imperatives because unless you design these systems to uh, really be respectful and, and uh, maintain people's confidentiality and to preserve the provider-patient relationship, um, you're actually doing more harm than good in, from a public health perspective. Um.
I'll just leave this here, um, kind of a sad note. But uh, you know, I think it's really important as we deploy policy interventions in the context of the opioid crisis to do it in a way that actually is, uh, is, is based on sound evidence and it does not produce more harm um, than good. And that has not been necessarily the case in, in the uh, US. As you saw, you know, the crisis has really worsened, partly because a lot of the interventions that were deployed were not well calibrated to accomplish their aims. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. So we have about until 20 after the hour for questions. I'll try and keep a list if you just want to raise their hands. Um, yes, Mr. Just call me Leo, please. Um, I have a question uh, sort of related to the fentanyl crisis. Um, what about the surveillance of government officials and the structural system? Who is really bringing these drugs into the country out of street drugs? And what about the structural surveillance instead of the individual surveillance? And does this coincide with the population of the country? And who is monitoring and tracking street drugs being brought into the country by those in power? government officials and drug cartels that are connected to them? So um, the controlled substances regime, you know, the statutes related to controlled substances set up a pretty, you know, that was set up in the 70s, creates a, a really sort of robust or supposedly robust system for tracking drugs that are brought in both both on the legal side and the legal side, and creates you know a, a whole there's a whole huge effort of interdiction. So the postal service and the police and the coast guard and all these different agencies. You know I'm not again I'm not familiar uh, intimately familiar with the Canadian sort of architecture of how that works, but there's a bunch of agencies that collaborate on controlling the flow of drugs into the country. And as you alluded to, you know, there are definitely problems with that. There's corruption. Um, there is, you know, probably, you know, the postal service probably is under-resourced to actually track um, what's coming in. You know, there's obviously a huge volume of products coming in in general. And so it's hard to have that trade be functional and also create the kind of controls that would be necessary to monitor, closely monitor that drugs are not entering um, through, you know, container ships and mail and, and so forth. But I think it's also worth noting that, um, you know, from just kind of economics perspective, um, I just wrote a paper on this actually. So, you know, classical economics dictates that basically as long as there's their demand for a product, the black market will find a way to bring that product in or create or manufacture it domestically. So you can't talk about um, you know, drug control efforts from the interdiction side without also addressing the fact that there's you know, a major supply for illegal uh, illicit opioids in Canada. And until you address that demand, the supply will always come. And that's just the function of the, you know, the market system because there's money to be made and uh, it'll find a way. And even in the most restrictive countries, which you know, Canada is not, but you know, places like Iran and Singapore that have the death penalty for drug trafficking, there's still major drug problems. So, well, not in the case of Singapore, but certainly in, 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 the, case of, in the case of Iran. So I guess what I'm saying is um, their interdiction issue is important, but you have to be careful about focusing on interdiction without focusing on the demand and also talking about the root causes of that demand. You know, why, why are people seeking out these drugs on the black market? Extent the um, development of PP programs is driven by public demand for them. 
And the second one was leading to that. Um, you know, the suggestion that the opiates are the origin of the epidemic. Um, so there's a lot of other thoughts around that. If there's some 3D modeling about what else is happening that we graph um, the, the um, 2011, uh, September 9-11 crisis and the culture of fear that came from that and the economic crisis. So there's a lot yeah. else happening in the population that's putting the population at a point of um, looking for some self-medication of anxiety and hope in life. Yeah. And so to what extent is our narrative we focus on opioids, a driving a, a demand for PMP programs, which ultimately you know, you're suggesting maybe is actually counter to what we're trying to achieve? Great, great question. So the first question is to what extent the public has demanded these programs. I think that's a, um, you know, there's a complex relationship between sort of public and policymakers and, uh, you know, folks in government who are regulators. And I think to a major extent, the reason why PMPs became so popular on a policy level, and you saw that graph where, you know, there's just a huge explosion in the number of and scope of these programs. Um, the prescription, the conversation about overprescribing presents a simplistic answer to very complex problems. And policymaking oftentimes zeroes in on easy fixes. <clears throat> So PMP, I think, to a large extent, be, as well as other efforts to limit prescribing, you know, such as, uh, you know, in certain states in mass, in, in U.S. now, the uh, prescription of opioids is mandated to be limited to three days, uh, at least the initial prescription. So there's a, you know, there's a mandate of healthcare practice that limits the initial prescription to three days, and then if you need to refill that prescription, you have to go to the doctor again to, to fill the prescription. You can't do it by phone. Um, so these kinds of interventions create a mirage of simple answers to very complex problems. And I think that PMPs, uh, to a large extent, are an example of that. You know, they, uh, if, if the problem is deemed to be overprescribing and these rogue providers, which are actually a tiny slice of of the you know opioid access, but the narrative is very attractive, and um, I think we basically became seduced by that narrative instead of focusing on, as you alluded to, what is actually what are the root causes of the rise in opioid prescribing and and opioid use, um, and in fact in the U.S. I don't know what the data look like here. You see, you do see. Uh, for example, real income or real uh, purchasing power and other economic factors uh, essentially go hand in hand with the rise in opioid use. So like, you know, people have fewer, uh, people have less purchasing power, there's a lot of economic anxiety, there's a uh, um, uh, you know, huge rise in income inequality and other kinds of structural factors that are extremely difficult to talk about and to fix. But unless you talk about them, you're not really talking about what's driving the crisis. And um, you know, the, uh, the reason why my belief, uh, why the crisis has morphed in a way that's essentially unmoored it from being uh, you know, focused on a, on a prescription supply and certainly being problematic, but it's just exploded is because we've applied all of these interventions that have uh, that have basically made it harder for people to get access to prescription supplies and have uh, moved the population to the black market without addressing demand. And that demand is based on, you know, having access to quality health care, having access to quality mental health services, having access to uh, substance use services, as well as having um, a decent and functional safety net and addressing people's economic and other kinds of concerns. You know, it's a complicated conversation, uh, very, very difficult to talk about what are the policy fixes to those problems. Um, much easier to talk about, you know, let's, let's impose a policy solution that is, 
you know, discreet and simple and, uh, and call it a day, but unfortunately that um, promises to, to address the crisis very little. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Hi, Hi. how are you doing? Good. Good. Um, just wanted to address, uh, as you say, it's a very complicated issue. Um, there's a lot of infrastructural factors to look at it from a, ideally a non subjective point of view. Uh, I just want to focus on a specific one that was alluded to in a few of the readings that were uh, assigned for this first mm -hmm. lecture from the CMAJ, and that was the uh, case of Bridge Music of Arms, uh, Burma, mm -hmm. which um, allegedly provided free textbooks to all Canadian medical students that said oxycodone had a 1% risk of uh, addiction. Right. Now, this seems like a very ostensibly ingrained issue in Canadian medicine, um, maybe in America as well, but this is a specific instance. Uh, and I'm not really sure between the Royal College and the medical schools and the relevant <coughs> regulators, where would we even start with such an issue? Yeah, no, uh, I think, you know, it's, I find myself in a weird position as being an ardent critic of the pharmaceutical industry and regulatory capture um, of, of sort of kind of defending pharmaceutical companies. I'm not, def uh, which is actually not true. I'm not defending them. There's certainly, um, you know, egregious practices and regulatory capture is real. And the fact that, you know, pharmaceutical companies are, uh, oftentimes indoctrinating healthcare providers without an alternative view being presented. So there's now actually a really uh, hopeful practice of academic detailing. I don't know if you've heard of that, but basically it's the idea that you can go to providers and present public health evidence instead of just presenting the, the you know, pharmaceutically uh, funded evidence. You know, we want to make sure that, that healthcare providers are receiving um, you know, balanced view, and oftentimes the speaker is, has generally been uh, biased. Uh, the speaker providing information to healthcare providers has been biased. We certainly want to minimize that and maximize evidence-based practice. Um, and, and, you know, decision support tools can actually play a good role in that because in designing them and in figuring out what information should go into decision support tools, you can have a filter that you know filters out biased information. So um, I think you know all of that said, it's also true that blaming pharmaceutical companies and, and evil pharma um, again is a simplistic response. I'm not saying that's that's what you're doing, but actually a lot of my colleagues in the states have now seized on this idea that it's you know it's uh, pharma companies. Let's sue the hell out of pharma companies, and everything will be fixed. That's not the case. From a public health perspective, you know, impact litigation in this area against pharma companies is not gonna make a difference. The crisis is no longer being driven even by <laughs> pharmaceutical drugs. So, so the idea that you can you know, sue pharma and everything will be well is, is highly flawed. And um, I think that we need to regulate pharma better. We need to make sure health, you know, medical education and education of all the healthcare uh, providers is balanced and is rooted in a lot of structural competency, not just cultural competency. So making sure that patients receive uh, structurally informed and trauma informed care. Um, but that is, um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, all of those things are important and, and regulating pharma is important, but, uh, but ultimately um, it's only one small piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Uh, just to take one piece of the sort of larger, uh, you know, maybe root causes or systemic issues to the, the supply or the, I guess the need, the demand. Um, as Canada gets ready to enter into this regulatory space, have you seen any statistical warping or correlation in states that decriminalize marijuana uh, and that impact on the sort of opioid demand? Yes. Yes. So um, actually, uh, when I when I talked about sorry. Yeah, well, specifically with the state, you know, the state dynamic. So uh, as you all probably know, the states have experimented with various uh, modes of marijuana re legalization or regulation, and that presents a lot of opportunity for research. So uh, those of you who are interested in policy research, you know, U.S. is a, well, Canada to a certain extent too, but U.S., you know, the, the diversity of policy approaches in the U.S. always presents a lot of opportunity for natural experiments. 
And so when you look at marijuana legalization or medical marijuana regulation, that is one of the factors in research that comes out as uh, being protective against uh, rising opioid uh, overdose rates. So states that have um, allowed medical marijuana earlier saw their opioid overdose rates rise at much lower levels or slower levels than states that did not. Now there are some you know, possible uh, contributing or um, confounding factors, but all the research that has been published so far, that policy element is one of the things that always comes out significant. So, uh, you know, at the very least, it gives um, promise to the idea that people might be uh, able to substitute opioid use uh, with marijuana use. Um, and in the U.S., there's very few places where marijuana is actually approved for chronic pain, for example. Um, so that's something that definitely warrants further exploration. It's a real quick question. We have one last question. Pretty straightforward. Uh, along the same veins in regards to using uh, prescription monitoring for overdose prevention, any context or past experience with publicly funded naloxone programs uh, based on information able to be gathered yeah. from monitoring programs to be able to implement that type of overdose prevention? Great question. So as I, as I mentioned, you know, prescription monitoring programs are, can be a tool to inform clinical care and harm reduction. So certainly makes sense for someone who is prescribed high doses of, of opioids as well as benzodiazepines or maybe co-using alcohol. That person should definitely be co-prescribed naloxone. Um, similarly, if you see on the prescription monitoring program a community where opioid, rate, opioid use rates are really high, that community should be targeted for overdose education and naloxone distribution programs. So there's definitely opportunities where you can use prescription monitoring data to inform harm reduction or harm minimization efforts. Um, unfortunately, it's very rarely used in that way, and I think that's something that we need to seize on and maximize and lift up. Great, thanks. So I want to thank Professor Bolotsky, but before I do, just a quick plug for our next seminar. Excuse me. Um, so our next and last seminar of this term uh, is on December 1st, another Friday, and the title of that presentation is The Use of Research in Veterans Health Policy Making, Making rather, and it will be given by the Vice President of Research here at Dalhousie University, uh, Alice Aiken. So please join us on December 1st. Now, um, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Bolesky for his insightful talk. I think it's a really powerful example of the theme of this year's Health Law Institute seminar series, which is one of interdisciplinarity, the field of health laws and the interdisciplinary field, which um, our Associate Director, Professor Joanna Herdman, has really been curating and developing. I think this is a powerful example through Professor Bolesky's um, case study, close observation of prescription drug monitoring programs in the United States to really run an epidemiology, not just with law, but of law, of how those programs are, are working in practice and the trade-offs that are embedded in them and how they might be improved in the future. So thank you very much, Professor Kolevsky, for that.